Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the kickoff event for Older Americans Month for San Mateo, San Francisco, and Santa Clara counties. My name is Ann Cooney. I'm with Daly City Recreation and Library Services in the Active Adult Senior Services Division. And I'm very honored to be here today representing my colleagues throughout the three counties and uh, to have the pleasure of facilitating uh, our wonderful event today, starring the amazing Doug McConnell, who you see here, along with our panelists, Joanne and Scott, and later on, Sue will be joining us for the Q&A. So we welcome you. We hope everybody's comfortable and that your screens are good and the volume's good, and we're ready to go. Here we go. Happy Older Americans Month. Hello everyone, I'm Shauna Malpe, the City Manager for the City of Daly City, and it is my sincere honor to kick off a month of celebrations dedicated to older Americans. Historically, Older Americans Month has been a time to acknowledge the contributions of past and current older persons to our country, in particular those who defended our country. Older Americans Month is celebrated across the country through ceremonies, events, fairs, and other such activities. The theme for Older Americans Month 2021 is Communities of Strength. Now more than ever, it is important that our communities stay strong. A significant part of maintaining community strength is ensuring effective outreach to our older population, especially now when so many people are feeling isolated. It's worth noting that older adults are the most rapidly growing age demographic in fact, close to 25% of the Daly City population is currently over 60. Thankfully, before the pandemic hit our communities, Daly City had already gained international recognition for its work to support older adults and is now designated an age-friendly city by the World Health Organization and AARP. Daly City has a robust age-friendly task force with staff and citizens dedicated to the planning and programming of age-friendly programs. It is my honor to personally sit on that task force. I have a background in gerontology and I try to bring that lens to the many services we provide in our city. I also understand the importance of intergenerational activities, bringing younger and older generations together for a common purpose, to build on strengths, nurture understanding, and challenge ageism. On a personal note, my teenage daughters and I have a very close relationship with my mom who just turned 80. We all struggled through the necessary social distancing of the past year, but it was particularly difficult for my mom because she lives alone. My family had a collected sigh of relief when Grammy got her second dose of the vaccine and we could begin spending quality time with her. Needless to say, it has been an extremely challenging and isolating time for many, and we must honor our older population. Now that many are getting vaccinated, I look forward to offering in-person intergenerational activities sometime soon as a way to further foster a community of strength. I'm excited to introduce our kickoff event called Time in Nature, a talk show with live Q&A hosted by the dynamic Doug McConnell. Doug McConnell is a television journalist who has focused on environmental issues with programs on the air continuously since 1982. He has created, produced, and hosted many series, special programs, and news projects for local, national, and international distribution. He has received many regional grant Emmys and other broadcast awards during his long career in television. He serves on the advisory board of the local environmental watchdog, San Francisco Baykeeper, and has been honored recently by the Marin Humane Society as Humanitarian of the Year, and by the San Francisco Bay Trail Project as Volunteer of the Year, by California State Parks as Honorary Ranger of the Year, and by the National Park Service as Honorary National Park Ranger. McConnell's most recent venture is the creation of an online travel community called openroad.tv with Doug McConnell, the traveler's video guide to the American West. Thank you, Doug McConnell. I would also like to give a big shout out to the following groups, the older adult recreation services teams in San Francisco, San Mateo and Santa Clara counties who got this program off the ground. Sunnyvale Recreation, who secured funding from Santa Clara County to enlist Doug McConnell's participation and the Daly City Recreation Marketing Team. 
Without further ado, I will now turn it over to Doug McConnell's Time in Nature talk show and live Q&A. We hope you will enjoy it. Stay strong, Daily City. Hello, I'm Doug McConnell. It is a real pleasure for me to be uh, here with all of you today. Uh, I love uh, what we're going to get a chance to talk about, and I'd love to hear your stories, probably more than my own. But uh, uh, basically, I grew up in California. I was born in California, raised here. My family, I have a couple of granddaughters who live in the East Bay, and they are now sixth generation California natives. Uh, and so I had a chance to explore all over uh, California, then went away for a long time living and working in other parts of the nation and the world, many years in Alaska, uh, for example. But in 1983, my wife Kathy and I were having our first baby, uh, and it was time to come back home, to raise our family, to go to work here. And so I've had this incredible pleasure to be back living and working in the Bay Area for now 38 years this year, half my life, and uh, having a chance to do the kind of work uh, where I get to wander around, uh, fall in love with this incredible place all over again and, and and tell stories about it meet extraordinary people doing wonderful work on our behalf to take care of this place of ours and to interpret it and i have to say these last 38 years have been the gift of all gifts uh, to come back to fall in love with my home in new deeper more profound ways to get to know it better than i ever knew it before uh, to get to uh, share what I find with other people. Uh, that's what I've been doing on TV since uh, 1983 with series like uh, uh, Mac and Muttley with a Little Doggy, uh, some of you may remember. Uh, uh, Bay Area Backroads for uh, about 16 years. I, uh, uh, I took over Bay Area Backroads in 1980, 1993 when Jerry Graham, who started the show, retired. And uh, Mac and Muttley had just ended, so I picked up Bay Area Backroads, and I did it for 16 years. Jerry had done it for eight, so Backroads was on the air for 24 years, Saturday, Sunday nights. Uh, and when it went off the air, by the way, it was the we did some research. It was the had been the longest running regional field produced show in American broadcast history, and uh, uh, that had to do with the fact Jerry did it really well. We did it the best we could, but I think people here in the Bay Area just love learning about all these things, and uh, it's been just a pleasure to tell stories about them, and now the last seven years, we've been on uh, NBC Bay Area, Channel 3 on Comcast Cable, doing a series called Open Road with Doug McConnell Sunday nights at 6.30, so I guess that's me. You know, I love, of course, all three counties. I've had the chance to live in a couple of them, explore them uh, in so many different ways. And so in a certain way, the, uh, uh, the list is endless. And uh, I could probably come at this one way today and another way tomorrow, but uh, here's some ideas. Uh, let's go so north to south. Uh, San Francisco County, I mean, it, it's so interesting because this is, the, I think, the second densest city in the United States in terms of population uh, per square uh, uh, acre, an inch, uh, and yet it has so many parks, open spaces, outdoor places to go to get fresh air, to get a little bit of exercise, to learn a bit about history, to uh, uh, see our fellow neighbors out there, to build community on, on trails and public spaces. And so we are beyond over the top lucky. And there are many places in San Francisco, of course, that jump right to mind, you know, from the uh, from Golden Gate Park, which just celebrated its 150th birthday last year. And uh, the uh, the transformation of that area out on the dunes into this magnificent uh, big public park for all the people and, and and so many other spots. But what's jumping to my mind right now is the rebirth of the San Francisco waterfront since the Loma Prieta earthquake in 1989. And if you turn the clock back, to 1989, in many ways, San Francisco, with this ex magnificent waterfront, had turned its back on the waterfront. And the earthquake happened, the, uh, the great uh, double-decker freeway that used to block public access to the water's edge had to come down. Uh, if you walk along the Embarcadero now from uh, you know the baseball field all along the Embarcadero up by the ferry building, all of that is new, restored, open, accessible, fresh air of the bay, the views of the, of the bridge and uh, Treasure Island and Yerba Buena Island. And, and then the trail goes on. In fact, even now south of, uh, of the ballpark, it's opening up too with more and more public access to that, that wonderful area. But if you're going north, uh, 
the ferry building itself, that's been restored since uh, 1989. Onward from there, you come across uh, uh, lots of little nooks and crannies that we can go see and enjoy the bay on, uh, on trails that are interpreted. Trail meaning the, uh, you know, the, the bay trail, San Francisco Bay Trail, running right along there, but that's really a pedestrian walkway. It's a commuting walkway. It's all these things. And all the people of the world come here to see it and enjoy it. Exploratorium is there. Onward, uh, past the access to uh, uh, the, the boats that go out to Alcatraz and on to Fisherman's Wharf. And that's a very interesting area, Fisherman's Wharf, even for those of us who live here to come down and see the sea lions that have made their home since the Loma Prieta earthquake. 1989, the sea lions came on the docks of the uh, boat harbor that was there at the time. They took it over and uh, lo and behold, that arrival of the sea lions was the arrival of tourism back to San Francisco. People came to see the, the sea lions by right by Pier 39. So you have all these little nooks and crownies since the Loma Prieta earthquake out west on past Aquatic Park, which is also being restored and enhanced now out to uh, the uh, Marina Green, magnificent place to go. And then beyond that, you have Chrissy Field, the Presidio. In 1989, the Presidio was still a military base, and the shoreline by the edge of the bay was a uh, well, former uh, military activity and kind of landfill. And now that is the magnificent Chrissy Field, part of the Golden Gate National Recreation Area, open and made accessible to the public by around the year 2000, uh, and glorious walks to the Golden Gate Bridge and around, then around the edge of that, along the bluffs, out to Land's End. And, all those trails, all those overlooks, all that restored environment to Land's End, then down to where the Cliff House is, and we'll see what this future is going to be, and then out to Ocean Beach. To think about that entire waterfront from Ocean Beach all the way back around to the other side as being available for all of us to enjoy, for our health, our well-being, to learn about history, to see nature, to visit with one another, is one of the great waterfront restoration stories in American history. And we have it right here. San Francisco has it right here that we can all come and enjoy. Uh, so much more to talk about with San Francisco. San Mateo County, oh my gosh, how do you, how do you start and end with San Mateo County? Uh, all kinds of places to go for, again, to, to uh, be outside and to see nature and to learn about history in a wide variety of contexts, including where we are right here uh, at the, uh, uh, the, the dual site of Broderick and Terry. And I think it was 1859, the, uh, uh, these uh, opponents of uh, what would become the Civil War came out to wage a duel with each other and Broderick killed Terry, and, uh, but they were able to fight a duel in the, what was then a remote spot far away from San Francisco, now part of Daly City, and a great little park that interprets that history. But onward from here, uh, you know, I just love things like San Bruno Mountain. San Bruno Mountain, this extraordinary uh, place of nature rising up above uh, the northern part of the county, uh, is hide been hiding in plain sight in many ways. It was saved from the, being uh, chopped up and, and destroyed, and now it's a place where we can go and walk on trails and enjoy great vistas and, and be with nature. The, uh, the great diversity of, of butterflies and other species that are on that mountain, such a wonderful place to just go right near our homes, right above, uh, right above Daly City and Colma and South San Francisco and all the way looking with views in all directions, spectacular place to go. I really love Old Devil Slide. The Highway 1 that used to go along the coast and it was such a dangerous place to drive in so many ways and would be so often closed because of uh, landslides. Well, of course, that was finally closed after many, many years of debate and issue about, about saving that slide or, or building a big freeway around it. Decision was finally reached by the people of the county who voted to preserve that area to build a couple of tunnels, the Tom Lantos tunnels, right through the mountain and therefore protect the old road, which is now a public trail. And you can park at the north side before going in, if you're going to the south, or the south side, and there's great access to this old road where you can walk out and just enjoy the great views of the Pacific, learn about the geology, learn about nature, uh, and, and remember, for those of us of a certain age, what that road was like and now celebrate the fact that this is a public access trail with families out there and people from all over one of my favorite spots. And then, uh, you know, if you're interested in history, uh, you know, this was the arrival place 
of the uh, Portola expedition, the Portola expedition of 1769, the first Europeans to come up and see San Francisco Bay. And this was a quite a tale of a, a journey up the coast by the Portola expedition, uh, the expedition coming to uh, Big Basin State Park, which is now Big Basin State Park down near Onionawebo, and actually that's Santa Cruz County. They almost starved, they were almost throwing in the towel and, uh, and yet somehow they ate a particular uh, berry that was growing there that gave them the vitamin C to recover what looked like from near death, which they thought was a miracle. They continued their journey up the coast into San Mateo County, up the coast. They met the Ohlone people who lived there for thousands of years. These were the first people from somewhere else they'd ever seen. And they were given this grand, uh, grand journey up the coast, taken care of by the Ohlone people from place to place to place. Uh, and, uh, you know, the Ohlone people who were then later to experience tremendous loss after the arrival of the Spanish in force in 1776. But at that time, they were the host to make sure that the Portola expedition got safely wherever it was headed. And finally, in San Mateo County, they go to the top of Sweeney Ridge in part of the Golden Gate National Parks now, where we can hike if you've got the capacity to go up a big steep hill. And there they saw the San Francisco Bay for the first time. So Sweeney Ridge, uh, an important part of our outdoor recreation opportunities, and uh, and yet also with this great history. And then on from there, down the you know down the coast, uh, along the along the bay at places like Ravenswood, uh, near East Palo Alto, to get out near the shoreline and to see nature being restored in the hills all above. Uh, landscapes that many of them are uh, cared for by San Mateo County Parks or by the Mid Peninsula Regional Open Space District. And I can go on and on. Unfortunately, I am going on and on. And finally, maybe Santa Clara County, just a number of things that jump to mind. There's so many possibilities. On the uh, west side, there's the Bear Creek. Uh, 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 Redwoods Preserve, part of the Mid Peninsula Regional Open Space District. Great place to walk around Redwoods and see a restored pond and a historic building. And uh, you know, go to the top of Mount Umanum, the, the great mountain that looms high above the Silicon Valley. Uh, you can drive to the top, you can go see these great vistas, you can learn about the native people, the Amamutsun, for whom that was a sacred mountain, and about the Air Force that was there during the Cold War. Nature, history, views, vistas. Uh, it goes on and on down to Coyote Valley. The Coyote Valley uh, uh, Open Space Preserve is a spectacular place to go and take a short walk and be in these great oaks and these wonderful woodlands to see all sorts of bird species. A few examples, probably way too many. You know, go right, right next to San Jose is the little historic town of Alviso. And Alviso uh, was sinking into the bay, uh, subsiding into the bay, but and flooded many times. Well, Alviso has been saved and is now being secured for the future because the wetlands all around it are being restored and some more levees are being built. But Alviso is a wonderful town to go and explore history, but then to come out and to watch the great wetland restoration that's going on there and at the Don Edwards Wildlife Refuge right nearby. Spectacular place where nature is returning and providing new marshlands, tidal marshlands that will serve as buffers from the rising seas that are coming with climate change. Great for nature, great for uh, us, great for us to walk along the Bay Trail and other places there. Alviso is great. And then uh, one more thing while I'm thinking about it. Go to Mount Hamilton, the top of Mount Hamilton, which you can see from down below with the historic Lick Observatory built in 1888 on top of Mount Hamilton, 4,200 feet above uh, the Silicon Valley, Santa Clara Valley down below. And uh, this was the first wor uh, the world's first year round mountaintop observatory, 1888. And now all these uh, decades later, University of California continues modern uh, research into the heavens in observatories on top of the hill. Great place you could drive up. It's a narrow winding road. Take your time, get to the top. You'll be treated with spectacular views with the history of the Lick Observatory and of the current work being done by the astronomical community on the top of uh, uh, the Lick Observatory. And then keep going down the backside of Mount Hamilton into the most remote, big, wild region of the entire Bay Area on the only one little road that winds its way through. And uh, you will be treated to beautiful, wild nature, historic ranches. Maybe see tule elk, uh, maybe see antelope. Uh, you'll see potentially ball, uh, uh, gold eagle, golden eagles, one of the greatest uh, uh, co congregations of golden eagles anywhere in the, anywhere in the world, and uh, and much much more. And so 
that's a great journey to take. And those are only a couple examples of the many, many things in these three spectacular counties. Our, our, our parks, our public lands, our open spaces, our trails uh, that we have here in the Bay Area, at a scale no other urban region, major urban region in our nation or the world really has. We have more protected land uh, and more protected shoreline than any major urban region in the world and it's accessible to each and every one of us. And there are so many places that we can go depending on our, our physical abilities or our interests or the time of year or the seasons. And uh, these places have been for me personally the places that uh, that I go to find solace, to center myself, to get some great exercise, to breathe the fresh air, to be restored uh, physically, spiritually, uh, mentally, and and to take my family. It's places. These are places where, you know, my wife Kathy and I took our our two little kids, who are now themselves adults, and enjoy these spaces. Uh, to, for time together, places uh, that are absolutely essential to our health and well-being. I think that the pandemic, you know, has made clear what I think so many of us knew coming into the pandemic, but that the pandemic reinforced that these public lands and natural spaces and open spaces of ours aren't just nice to have. They're essential. They're essential for our, our, our health. Again, our physical health, our mental health, our spiritual health and well-being, and our community's health. When the pandemic hit, these already popular places, in many cases, received historic influxes of new people coming because that was the only place they could go. And these many people may not have really been to those parks and open spaces before, but they discovered them. And it's been extraordinary to watch the uh, the eyes opening up as so many people see these places sometimes for the first time and just realize how lucky we are to have these assets right in our backyards, right near our communities, accessible freely, most of it, to each and every one of us. And so I would just say uh, th these lands are exactly what the doctor ordered. They're what the doctor ordered during the pandemic and many of us benefited from it in ways that we can never even quite thank the, uh, these lands for, but that we can appreciate them more for. And, uh, and that's what the doctor ordered for our futures as we move forward through our lives. However many years we have, those years are gonna be enriched by time outside in these beautiful places of ours. And boy, we are the luckiest people I can, I can think of in any urban area in the world. It is impossible for me to really say, here's my favorite place because, uh, you know, like your children, I, I, I love all my children the same, uh, at least to the extent that I feel a connection to so many places that have meant so much to me personally in my lifetime that I've gotten to know and love and cherish in all kinds of different ways. So, so choosing two is, um, I apologize for all the other uh, thousands that I uh, will remember when I walk out and say, oh, well, how about those guys? Uh, but if there are a couple places that I would have to um, say mean a special amount to me, uh, well, I'd have to say one of them is the, uh, the Golden Gate National Recreation Area. Our great national park uh, turns 50, by the way, next year, 2022. Uh, in October 27th, 1972, President uh, Richard Nixon uh, signed into law the creation of the Golden Gate National Recreation Area. One of the first two, uh, uh, New York Harbor was signed in the same day as a national park, but the Golden Gate National Recreation Area was signed as one of the first two national parks right where people live. Until that time, the closest national park to the Bay Area was Point Reyes National Seashore. But that was a rarity. That was established in 1962. But the GGNRA was placed right where people live, in San and Marin, San Francisco, and San Mateo counties. And it has grown now to be about an 80,000-acre national park, uh, pre-pandemic and post-pandemic, uh, often the most visited national park in the nation, with nature and history and beaches and mountains and coastline and uh, most extraordinary place to go uh, to explore and have a wonderful time with your family. And, and and you can be right in the city in San Francisco along Chrissy Field or in the Presidio. And the Presidio is being restored. And by the way, later this year, 
in 2021 and early 2022, the new tunnel tops is going to be added to the Golden Gate National Recreation Area to the Presidio, connecting the upper part of the Presidio parade grounds to Chrissy Field down below over the new tunnels that have been built. So we're gonna be able to walk out there. It's newly, land newly landscaped with native plants and vegetation, interpreting the history of, uh, of the Presidio and California and walk down. There's gonna be an area for children to be active and engaged uh, in a, a, a natural environment of, and play areas and learning about stuff. It's gonna be a grand gift knitting together uh, that part of the Golden Gate National Recreation Area. So new things coming up all the time. Uh, and so being in that park, I drove down here to be in Daly City for this conversation today. And of course I drive right past the Golden Gate National Recreation Area across the Golden Gate Bridge, which is the most famous national park bridge <laughs> in the world, connecting two parts of the national park on the north and the south. And I just literally pinch myself every time I'm there to realize all of that could have been built, all of that was gonna be houses, it was gonna be development, it's gonna be paved over, but it was saved by people who just really cared and had a different vision, and they gained the support of the uh, people of the Bay Area, of the Congress of the United States, of the President of the United States, to say, no, this place that includes Alcatraz, the Presidio, the Marin Headlands, all of that, that needs to be a part of our national park system and 50 years later, it's a gift that millions of us enjoy every single day. And so I just thank those people who made it possible. Three primary parents of the GGNRA, the late Phil uh, Burton, Congressman Phil Burton from San Francisco, the late Dr. Edgar Weyburn, uh, probably the most important conservationist in American history, few of us know little about, and just one of his achievement, achievements was to be one of the founding parents of the GGNRA. Uh, died at the age of 103, and we cherish his memory. And Amy Meyer, who went to work with Ed Weyburn all those 50 years ago to help make this national park possible. Amy is still involved, engaged, working on behalf of her beloved park and behalf of all of us. And uh, I salute all of them. So that's near and dear to my heart. Plus my older son, Nicholas uh, at Chrissy Field, and my wife, Kathy and I got to be there, proposed to his wife with the Golden Gate Bridge in the background. And uh, we handed the, him the ring that he wanted uh, Kathy to hold. And he got on his knee and proposed to Kat. So hard to beat that. And Oh gosh, choosing another place is such a true, genuine uh, challenge. I, I have to say for now uh, that I wanna celebrate the East Bay Regional Park District. The East Bay Regional Park District, literally across the bay, uh, was born in the depths of the Great Depression, 1934, when the people of, at that point, Alameda County, in the most uh, inspiring vote I can think of sitting here right now, voted to tax themselves in the depression to create the world's first regional park system led by, uh, by Robert Sproul, the head of the University of California at the time and, and others. They realized that great cities need great parks and they believed that that incredible East Bay, now Alameda and Contra Costa counties needed to have more parks for the people, right where the people live. And so the taxpayers supported them. The Golden, uh, East Bay Regional Park District came into being in 1936. It's first three parks, Tilden Regional Park, right above Berkeley. Many of you may have been to it. A gem, a gem in all kinds of ways of nature, of history, of, of trains, of merry-go-rounds, of families enjoying it, botanical gardens. There was, uh, it was one of the first, uh, what is now the uh, Assembly of Volcanic Preserve was one of the others and Redwood Regional Park being the third. And it opened in 1936. Now, all these 80, uh, what, five years later, the East Bay Regional Park District is 120,000 acres in two counties, 73 parks, 1,200 miles of trails, and everything imaginable from the shoreline of the, of the East Bay to the tops of the ridgelines to old historic uh, coal mines and uh, uh, in, in the East Bay, black diamond mines. Uh, it is just this extraordinary complex gift to all the people of the East Bay, but to all of us as well. 
And uh, I just have treasured those experiences and I've gotten to know so many of those who made that park district possible over its many, many years. The late Bill Mott, who was his general manager, later became director of uh, California State Parks and then our national park system, uh, really helped to get that East Bay Park District growing in the early 60s. And Richard Trudeau became the general manager afterwards. And with people like Hewlett Hornbeck and others, they they grew it and made it more accessible and made it more uh, more perfect in its ways. Pat O'Brien became a general manager, did more in the 80s. And Bob Doyle recently retired after a 47-year career in the Park District. I just think of all these people, just people like us, who could have done anything with their lives. And what they decided to do was to, to help create treasures that we and our children and grandchildren and future generations will benefit from. I just uh, put out a great love letter to, to all of them and to those places and to all the others. I'm just not getting around to mentioning right now. So in, in closing, uh, there's so much that I could say, but I think really the heart and soul of it is, no matter what age we are, um, I just encourage everybody to get out in these public spaces of ours and all these trails of ours and to take moments and enjoy them, whether they're right in your backyard or a little further away. Um, these are places to go and, again and heal ourselves and, and remain healthy and remain engaged. And, and uh, you know, for people my age, I'm 76 and, and older, all of us uh, or younger, uh, you know, that's something that we can continue to do in various ways for a long time to come. And, uh, and, and ideally be able to go with our family and be able to go out with young people and just treasure all of these moments. Uh, to me, they are sort of where I go when I, uh, when, I, when I just have a moment. And in addition to enjoying it, in addition to benefiting from the health, I just really encourage all of us to support these places. None of these places happened by accident. They happened because people cared for them, they fought for them, they worked to make them happen, uh, and they only can do all of that, those activists, with all of us supporting them as voters, uh, as philanthropists in whatever ways we can give time or money uh, or support to these great causes, to the, the nonprofit organizations, the, uh, the foundations, San Mateo County Parks Foundation is an example, uh, uh, the Golden Gate National uh, Parks Conservancy, an example here uh, for the GGNRA, there are many. They need our support and they can use our support as volunteers at whatever age and whatever skills we have to offer. So let's go enjoy these places. Let's go with our community. Let's knit community. Let's build relationships with everybody that are positive and hopeful. And then let's support these great causes and uh, we'll all benefit and our grandkids are going to benefit, and uh, I can promise all of that will make you feel good. And I hope to see you out here sometime. Hope you can hear me and see us. Um, yeah. I know I'm, uh, my name is Ann Cooney. I'm honored to be the active adult senior services supervisor with the city of Daly City, and I'm very grateful to be able to facilitate this live question and answer segment with the amazing Doug McConnell this morning. I know I'm supposed to be very professional and calm and cool, but I'm literally sitting <laughs> feet away from a person who's been an inspiration and a hero. So welcome, Doug. Thank you for taking on us on this tour of some of the gems and the treasures of, of the Bay Area. Um, and also, happy birthday. Doug had a birthday last week, and one of his granddaughters is having a birthday today. And if he doesn't mind me saying this, he literally flew in from Alaska today to be part of this wonderful event. Um, so we do have three panelists joining us this morning. I'd like to introduce them. They'll be doing their leadoff questions. We have Sue Horst, who uh, the uh, Older Adult Recreation Services Division that is uh, has put together this wonderful celebration with Doug today, um, is, is in San Francisco, San Mateo, and Santa Clara counties. So this morning we'll get to talk to Sue Horse for a few minutes, and she's uh, coming in to us from San Francisco, Scott McMillan coming in from San Mateo County, and uh, we just lost Joanne, but I hope she'll be back in a second. Joanne coming in from Santa Clara. So I'm going to take a second though to, to ask the first question. I had the honor with my colleagues in Daly City to meet Doug a couple of weeks ago. 
And as he was wrapping up the beautiful segment he just shared with us, he talked to, to us about um, what he's kind of discovered to be the ingredients of the secret sauce to a life <laughs> well lived. And not just longevity, but being engaged and passionate. So Doug, if you wouldn't mind just starting off our question and answer segment, telling us a little bit about what you've learned through your travels and all the people you've met about the secret sauce. <laughs> The secret sauce may not be a secret, uh, and, uh, and it's probably a sauce that all of you uh, here, uh, you know, have uh, uh, experienced and understood. Uh, first of all, and uh, thank you so much uh, for inviting me to all of you for inviting me to to participate in this. I, I it's been a really an honor and a lot of fun, and I apologize for my ramblings <laughs> out there. But, you know, it's just um, uh, I get going and I sometimes get lost, so I'll try to I'll try to brain myself in a little bit here this morning, but just please know how much fun it is for me to be here, to be in Daly City right now with you and to be able to see you through the glass over there and, and uh, everybody else. Um, and oh, I have one thing before I give a quick answer there. I, I am listening to myself ramble away there. All that stuff was off the top of my head. And uh, I think I had most of the facts right. But I, I did make a mistake when I was thinking about the Broderick Terry duel in that little niche park here in Daly City where the duel of uh, September 13th, 1859 happened uh, with um, uh, Broderick and Terry. Broderick was a senator uh, who was sort of a unionist, and Terry was a Supreme Court justice who was a uh, uh, pro-slavery guy. And they had a, uh, they had a duel, and uh, actually uh, uh, Terry killed Broderick. And uh, Broderick became a, um, uh, more of a martyr for the, the union cause, and the, uh, the Civil War began in the next uh, couple of years. And, uh, and that was really a foreshadowing of the Civil War that, that occurred, the Broderick Terry duel. And it's sort of lost in history, but not lost in Daly City. It's a fun place to go and, 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 and see that and kind of catch up about our, about, uh, a bit more about our history, uh, right near Lake Merced. Um, but the secret sauce, I guess for me, uh, I, when I was young, <laughs> younger, uh, I always had friends who were of many ages, uh, older and younger. But I just, I love being with older people that I, uh, got to know and spend time with and hear their stories and uh, and that you know began very early in my life and what I began to learn early on was that the people that I found to be the most fulfilled the happiest the most um, uh, uh, you know joyful about their lives at whatever ages they were were those who were the most uh, engaged with living and with uh, with their passions with with others with their communities and uh, and I, uh, as I've as I've grown older uh, and studied that more, just sort of uh, uh, not in any scientific way, but just uh, anecdotally, uh, it has certainly been the case. I have um, and just and you just mentioned I came back from Alaska where I'd lived for many years. Uh, I went up with my wife Kathy. We're fully vaccinated. We decided we could make the trip. It's a place we know and love. We went to see the land. We went to see the animals. Uh, we uh, we went to see some dear old friends, and one of our dearest oldest friends is a fellow named Vic Fisher, uh, who was the, he's the last surviving member of the Alaska Constitutional Convention uh, when they wrote the state constitution in 1956, and that was implemented when Alaska became a state on January 3rd, 1959. Uh, Vic Fisher is now 97 years old, and has never quit being engaged, involved with his community, with his state, uh, with his family, and and to go spend time with Vic and to talk about you know his you know his years in Alaska, uh, working on all these topics, and and to this very day, literally, he'd gone to a, um, a physical therapy. He's 97. Gone to a physical therapy class just before we got together at his home with his wife Jane, and a dear old friend of ours. Um, and, and on the way back, he was on a cell phone conversation because the state legislature is deciding to uh, make the, uh, uh, the Alaska Constitution signing a state holiday. And they wanted to interview Vic and ask him why that was a good idea. So he was, he was testifying before you know, the state Senate committee on his phone in the car just before he came to see us. So I, it's a reminder to me that, um, that engagement is sort of that secret sauce in life. And I think... Uh, as I understand the gerontology a little bit, and many of you understand it better than I've studied it better, is that the oldest people on earth, I believe, are the Okinawan people as a, as a culture. And uh, what I learned a little bit from that was they didn't have a word for retirement. There was no word that translated to retirement. Uh, but they had many words that translated to engagement. Uh, 
that's about as close as our word comes to to the many words they have. Sort of like Eskimo people have many words for snow, they have many words for engagement. Mm -hmm. And and that that meant that no matter what people could do with their lives or what their passions were, physically or otherwise, that they remained engaged all their lives and were embraced by their community, were part of their community. And I think that's been the key. And uh, last, I would say, a couple of my great heroes and conservation heroes that I mentioned, one of them, Dr. Edgar Weyburn, who died at 103 in, 19, uh, in 2010, uh, you know, was active all the way up through his entire life and engaged all the way through. And now Dr. Marty Griffin uh, in Marin County, where I live, one of the two people who've helped to save the Marin and Sonoma Coast, will be celebrating his 101st birthday in June, still engaged, still active, still working for Point Reyes and other places that he cares deeply about. So anyway, that, that's my secret sauce and uh, uh, hopefully I can keep going for as long as we have, whatever that length is, to, to live as fully and as engaged as possible and I've been very lucky. Well, Doug, that offers a wonderful segue to our first panelist, Sue Horst, who's uh, whose footsteps I'm trying to follow in, uh, whose shoes I will never fill, and who's a great inspiration to us, and who's one of the busiest technically retired people that I know. So, <laughs> so welcome. Thank you for being the, a voice for San Francisco today. What would you like to share, and what would you like to ask Doug? Well, thank you, and um, I guess that means I'm engaged. Um, so, uh, Doug, you're... you're you're one of the uh, coolest, most engaged 76 year olds I, I now know. So um, you know, very impressive. And actually the last uh, eight years of my career after spending my life in Daly City was at the Aquatic Park bathhouse um, doing work as a director with the oldest senior center in the nation, Aquatic Park Center. And um, uh, inspired by, um, all of the leaders in Golden Gate National Recreation Area and the Maritime uh, National Historical Park. So um, that leads me to a question because in the park, there's amazing volunteerism, for example, um, being a docent, you know, leading, leading tours in the national park, et cetera. But I'm wondering, since you mentioned engagement and volunteerism, if um, you could articulate a little more about opportunities since people are here honoring Older Americans Month. There are people on here who could benefit from, I think, more specifics on how they can volunteer, where they can volunteer, and be engaged, and you know, a focus on non physical. So, if you know, people with disabilities can help, and um, exerting people who are athletic and want to help and people who are intellectual and looking for that kind mm -hmm. of a stimulation uh, from your experience base. Well, oh, gosh. Uh, well, Sue, thank you very much for that. And thanks for all the work that, uh, that you ha are doing. And, uh, uh, and, and Vaughn, you know, these, these uh, public assets of ours, our parks, our open spaces, uh, uh, the nonprofits that support them all, the, you know, they, uh, they all depend on the generosity of all of us and the generosity can be in many different uh, forms and certainly a major underlying form is volunteerism. Uh, every, I think uh, in maybe a, one way I would just simply say, what do you love? You know, do you, do you, have, do you have an organization or do you have a, a, a location? Do you have something that you have a particular passion for? And the answer is there will be volunteer opportunities there. And and not only uh, uh, to give you an opportunity to, to be engaged, but truly to make a difference. Um, you know, I think it's just um, without the armies of volunteers that all of these um, uh, public places of ours, all of these um, uh, uh, treasured assets of ours, uh, without volunteers, they wouldn't be able to function. There's not enough money in the world to pay for all the staff and all the talent and all the insight and all the, the uh, you know, the, the labors of love uh, that, um, uh, that keep them operating so successfully. So I'm thinking just, you know, for as, so I would say look wherever you live in Santa Clara, San Mateo, uh, San Francisco counties um, and, and contact those organizations and boy, they will, they will love to have you and know of great, know of great opportunities. I'm thinking just, sitting here right now of the Golden Gate National Parks Conservancy. Of course, they're, they're suffering. They've been suffering uh, uh, unexpectedly because of the pandemic. Uh, and, uh, uh, and yet, uh, you know, this uh, Golden Gate National Parks Conservancy has done so much incredible work 
uh, in support of the Golden Gate National Recreation Area uh, uh, for now uh, 35 years that the uh, Parks Conservancy has been really a, a fully uh, fledged, you know, building trails, um, you know, native plant uh, uh, nurseries, uh, uh, all kinds of ways in which people could get involved with Parks Conservancy. And as we come out of the pandemic, hopefully, we begin to return to some degree of uh, a new normal here where people will be out more, being able to go to the gift stores, being able to go to Alcatraz more, being able to really be part of that national park uh, in, uh, in many ways. Those volunteer opportunities are going to be are going to be huge for the Parks Conservancy as it uh, regains its financial uh, and it's still a strong financial organization, but as it gains its strength uh, in the in the months and years ahead. Uh, prior to the pandemic, I think that the Parks Conservancy had something like thirty thousand volunteers a year uh, participating in. Uh, a wide variety, planting plants, or as you say, uh, um, serving in, in other capacities. So whatever your skill is, whatever your passion is, whatever your place is, uh, there's a place and an opportunity for you. And uh, uh, you know, I just highly recommend that. And 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 I salute all those people who do volunteer, including you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And so I'd like to introduce Scott McMullen. Um, who is a, a wonderful member of the Commission on Aging in San Mateo County and a visionary and a leader in the villages of San Mateo County movement. Welcome, Scott. What would you like to ask Doug? Hi, thank you, Ann, and thank you, Doug. I, I got oh, very you. energized by your uh, talk <laughs> as, we, as we explored uh, many, many of the parks and open spaces of the Bay Area. Um, I want to describe villages for just a second for those that haven't heard of them. Villages of San Mateo County is one of several hundred nonprofits around the country that are called villages and they are, they're all independent and their basic goal is to enable older adults to continue to live independent, fulfilling lives in their own homes. So even though the word village is in there, it's, it's not a place, it's a community. So on behalf of our villagers in the Bay Area, I wanted to ask you, um, along the lines of our community being age friendly, as we get older, many of us don't have quite the mobility that we used to have. Uh, we maybe use a cane or a walker, perhaps even a wheelchair. From what you've seen of our open spaces, uh, how would you characterize the accessibility and age friendliness of open spaces in the Bay Area, which is so important for this demographic that is growing so fast. No, that's that's great, Scott. Well, thank you for that. And um, I'm a little familiar with the villages uh, in Marin, and uh, I, I'm just uh, you know looking ahead to my own future, and my, my wife and I looking ahead to our own. And that will be something we'll want to be exploring. You know, how do we continue to be able to live if possible in our own home and 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 fulfill the uh, the goals that, that, that you're seeking for for all the people who uh, participate um, well you know I, I think that I, on behalf of all the parks agencies that I you know have a, this pleasure to get to know and, and to work with and, and put the spotlight on whenever possible uh, I know that accessibility is a hugely important thing to all of those agencies uh, who are working to serve all the people uh, the, you know these are these are parks of by and for and uh, and the agencies uh, and the nonprofits that support them you know are all committed to this goal of, of making all of this uh, as open and accessible to everyone as possible and so in those areas uh, you know where you know where they're working of course there's some places where the accessibility would be you know is you know for if with physical limits you know uh, there are things places that are just not easy to go to or up or will be made make it made available some of the ridge top trails and I talked about hiking to the top of Sweeney Ridge uh, down here I mean that takes uh, you know some real you have to be physically able to get literally to the top up there but uh, but in so many places, there are so many opportunities where people can go and have the benefits of the outdoors and the benefits of nature on absolutely accessible, uh, in absolutely accessible ways. I think one of the uh, one of the great public assets of the Bay Area is the uh, has been the evolution of the San Francisco Bay Trail. Uh, if you turn the clock back to uh, uh, the 1960s, there was virtually when I was 
a young person, <laughs> a younger person. Uh, uh, there was virtually no public access to the shoreline of the bay. And if you wanted to go to the shoreline of the bay, you probably didn't want to go there anyway, because it was mostly landfills, dumps, that smelled to high heaven, uh, being polluted. Uh, and, uh, you know, the bay, the bay was, uh, uh, you know, at risk of extinction, actually. Well, turn the clock now uh, less than 60 years uh, to where we are today. And, um, uh, and now we have a, a bay that we've, we've saved, and now we're having to save it again with climate change and some other things, but we are re restoring wetlands, we're, uh, uh, we're, we're creating opportunities, and we're creating opportunities for public access to the bay shoreline. The San Francisco Bay Trail was born in 1989. Its first little official stretch of the Bay Trail was at the Hayward Regional Shoreline, right near the San Mateo Bridge uh, uh, in, in Hayward. And now, 32 years later, uh, there is more than 350 miles of Bay Trail around the Bay in every county, in every, almost in every community. And with those who are working on the Bay Trail assiduously and the community supporting it and the public supporting it, that'll eventually be a 500 mile long trail at the water's edge all around the Bay. And we're getting there. And uh, almost all of that is acceptable. Almost all of that is uh, there for anybody with any level of, uh, of physical uh, uh, strength or limit to go out and enjoy. And to just breathe in the fresh air, to soak up that day, to watch nature return on the restored uh, wetlands. Uh, and it is just a staggering public asset that, that only the Bay Area has. This was, and, I, and let me just add one last thing. I apologize for again going on too long, but I get excited about it. You know, you think about this and you think of all the problems we face in the world. Well, the Bay Area has been this problem solving community in so many ways. We had a problem, the Bay was dying, we stayed there. We had a problem, people didn't have access to the Bay Shoreline, we were making access to the Bay Shoreline. We have a problem with uh, climate change and sea level rise, but we're trying to restore the Bay Shoreline. We have a lot of work to do, and we're imperfect, but we're really trying to get there. And if I, if I look ahead and I know my physical limits will become greater and greater, I have those places to go, and I'm just forever grateful. And, uh, and I hope we continue to support them. Great, thank you. Thank you. It's almost as if we planned this and we didn't, but I'm so happy now to welcome Joanne back. Joanne, thank you for overcoming technology challenges. And uh, Joanne is an amazing leader and she's representing Santa Clara County with us today. She is uh, a member of the, uh, her questions are about accessibility and Americans Disability Act and okay. some of your thoughts, but I'll, I'll let her put it to you. Welcome Joanne, please tell us a little bit about yourself and and your question for Doug. Hi, Joanne. Sure. Um, hi, Doug. Hi, I've Joanne. been on a number of walks uh, with you with the Sunnyville Senior Center. So yep. that's been great. And in my case, I'm a disabled but still active individual. And uh, love going to Alviso and Baylands Parks because it's pretty flat, but still gives mm -hmm. me access to the oceans and other places. Um, I kind of heard this question from other people, but can you recommend open space areas which are more accommodating to our aging but still active handicapped visitors? My biggest challenge is lack of benches and bathroom access. Good. Oh, guys, can you uh, recommend any parks that might be more suitable right now? Right. Well, uh, that's that's a good question, Joanne. And I'm, uh, you know, as I, you know, have the question, I'm probably I'm gonna drive home. I'm going to start thinking of, oh, if there's, <laughs> there, there are these places. But one place that jumps to mind, I mentioned it in the, um, uh, in in the, in my long-winded <laughs> discussions <laughs> prior to this. Uh, uh, but uh, I, I really love over on the San Mateo coast the uh, uh, the double slide. Uh, you know, the, the, the public Devil Slide Trail, which is essentially the old road of the Devil Slide. And, uh, you know, that has a ac easy access from the north end of the, uh, uh, the tunnels and the south end of the tunnels. And, uh, and then there's, a, there's kind of a grade in that trail because the road went up the grade. If you remember the old Highway 1 that went along the Devil Slide, you know, that's now all a big, wide public uh, trail. Um, 
but there's there's uh, easy and comfortable access on, from both ends of it, and, and both, even if you don't go the whole thing, it's about a mile, a mile, point two, I think, long, but you could you go to the south end, uh, and, and it's pretty flat, and it's beautiful, and then you, it leads to extra, extraordinary views of nature and, and wonderful interpretation along the way, and there's uh, restroom facilities if, you know, on the south end as well as on the north end. If you go to the north end, you kind of come out, you're a little, come out of the higher elevation, you get a whole different view. And so I, I, lo I love that place, and it changes in every season and every day and every uh, you know, hour. So that, that's an example of, uh, of, of one. Um, I'm thinking again out loud of, uh, you know, uh, trying to think of Santa Clara County uh, areas that, I, well, I know one thing is going to be happening, Joanne, and I, I, this is just a kind of a, a prelude uh, without, a, without a specific answer. Uh, you know, there's some, not, there's some easy access into Coyote Valley Preserve. I think that as you come into the parking area there in the restrooms, there's a, uh, you know, there's a, there's a flat area that's, I think, reasonably accessible uh, going into, into that preserve and the trails to go up into the hills. Um, but Coyote Valley has been saved, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the yes. Coyote, and, and the future of Coyote Valley is, is going to be now a public planning process with the Open Space Authority and others who have been so engaged in, in helping to protect and preserve Coyote Valley for its agricultural and public uh, 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 recreational opportunities and, and wildlife access. The Coyote Valley is a, a, an extraordinary story of, uh, of saving old California and making it accessible to all of us. And one of the nice, what I'd recommend is uh, obviously is getting involved in that public planning process that they're going to be getting to lift off, as I understand it, this fall. And there'll be real great opportunities to say, how do we, how do we, in designing the, the future of that valley, now for the public access and protecting nature and agriculture, how do we make that truly accessible in ways that you're, that you're asking? And so that's a little bit a different answer than what's here right now, but that's, you know, at least something I would, uh, I would, uh, you know, say it's got an opportunity that's going to come, it's going to create tremendous new opportunities, uh, especially for those who live right there in San Jose. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, panelists, Sue, Scott, Joanne. Thank you so much. We had some similar questions about um, access, accessibility for our, uh, changing times in our lives. So uh, those were covered beautifully. Thank you. Um, any other questions, panelists or Doug? Any any closing remarks that you'd like to share as you as you launch us into Older yeah. Americans Month? Oh gosh, I, I just I, I I would love to just be able to sit down and have this long conversation with all of you and um, and really hear your ideas and more than my own. You have so much more to teach me, I think, than I'm that I'm I'm sharing with you. I, I would just say. Uh, well, one thing I, I didn't know when we had uh, and when we had our conversation out of there at the uh, the, the, the Roger uh, Perry dual site the uh, you know a week or so ago was that uh, this is about building stronger communities as well. It's uh, it's strength through community. And one of the things I've always loved about trails, one of the things I've always loved about public, these are our, literally our public squares. They're our public plazas. They're the places where we come uh, and can be with each other. And, and literally rub shoulders or see one another, no matter you know where we come from in the community. These are these are places to bind and build relationships, bind and build community, bind and build you know division across divisions, across you know ethnicities, across uh, wealth, and, and you know these are places for all the people, for all of us. And so I just really would close by saying I, I'm so proud of the Bay Area for protecting. Uh, these assets on behalf of all people and for all time and that um, uh, they offer us uh, a chance to build a stronger and stronger community uh, and a community devoted to caring, creating a better future for our children, our great, our grandchildren and, and on for generations. So I think um, we are just uh, lucky to have these assets, lucky to have a chance to help advance them and improve them and then uh, we can sit back hopefully and think um, there's a better future out there for, for those who will follow in our footsteps. Thank you again so much. So we have one last question that's sneaking in from Alejandra Hernandez, who's an <laughs> amazing member of the Mountain View uh, Recreation team. And she's asking, Doug, what are your necessities when you head out to explore trails? What are my necessities? Your necessities. Uh, a good pair of shoes, if I'm, I'm hiking. 
um, uh, yeah, mine is, <laughs> I just, uh, I see you push. Uh, 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 well, of course, during the pandemic, I had to have a mask with me, and I still do. And, uh, you know, there's some things that you have to be kind of, well, there we go, and I've got my mask uh, in here as well. Um, you know, so proper behavior on the trails. Uh, but I think basically for me, uh, I and sometimes research is good, and, and finding out about what's going to be out there is good to do. I don't. Uh, I just like to kind of head out and let let it someplace kind of uh, reveal itself to me. Uh, and I, I want to make sure that I'm, uh, you know, that I'm. Uh, if I if I'm going to be going for a long hike, I've got water. I, you know, that, that I'm I'm carrying things that I might need depending on how far I'm going and where I'm going, and what the weather's like, and everything else. But basically, my necessity is to uh, just to get out. And uh, I may have a plan uh, to walk so far or go so far, uh, and I may just uh, end up uh, just finding a beautiful view and saying, well, that's, that's good. That's what I want to have. So let, let nature speak to me. I think my necessity is to go with an open mind and an open heart and let nature reveal itself herself. I can't think of better words to end on. Just thank you again, Doug. Thank you, panelists. This uh, is just the beginning. Yeah, so you. we have dozens of more events planned. Please contact your local recreation division to find out how they're celebrating Older Americans Month this May. You can also, I, I just put in the chat, you can check out dailycityseniors.org, our current uh, our, our virtual senior center page does have a detailed listing of all the events in all three counties, including a Mother's Day dance party that's happening at two today, thanks to our <laughs> San Bruno team. So lots of fun. Thank you. Keep get outdoors with an open mind, and that's where that's that's the prescription. That's where I'm going. Thank you, Doug. <laughs> Thank you, Sue. Thanks, Thank you, Joanne. Guys. Thank you, Scott. Thanks, Thank everybody. you, everyone who participated. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> bye, bye bye. Have a good time. Get outside. Thank you, Doug. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Scott. Thank Bye. you very much.